Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Today is a gigantically huge, huge, huge day for the channel. We finally get to talk to Joseph Rodriguez. If anybody has ever accessed my videos, I'm sure they've accessed Joseph's and same way, either way. Uh, jo Joseph is one of my favorite teachers on YouTube. I've learned so much. Check out his channel. You can find it just by going to Joseph Rodriguez. I'll put a link in the description. And if you check out Joseph's stuff, you know that he and I are on the same level. He is an incredible reader. Many times I have read a book and thought, okay, I, I got to figure out what Joseph says about this. And now it's added to whenever I'm reading a book, I'm like, uh, I'll instantly go and search and see uh, Joseph's study notes. You've offered many study notes and, he, and Joseph discusses Neville Goddard and a variety of new thought authors, you name it. We're going to talk about so much stuff. And we've, this is a really unique interview because one of the first times I've actually got a chance to talk to Joseph a little beforehand. And so it's uh, going to be very interesting. So welcome to the Reality Revolution. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. And also, congratulations for putting together such a compendium of resources and perspectives. I very much uh, am enjoying this recent video that you did. So I don't know when you're going to release this, but the one on the laying on the hand stuff, because it ties so much as into where my current thread of conversation is because that's the way i like to look at this channel that i created it was a thread of conversation right so it started out as an idea my very first video was this living out of a backpack video so we can talk about that if you'd like i saw that and, you know i just like one thing led to the next went into book discussions which were a reflection of my entrepreneurial journey mm -hmm. uh, some of your viewers who know my channel know i talk about my uh years in my it business and so i wanted a place where i could discuss these books that have been so helpful for me as well as read them again, because, you know, when you go back and you, you apply something and then you go back and read it again, it's like you understand it even more based on the experience. I always say knowledge plus experience equals wisdom. And these books that I've shared on my channel and I've discussed, I could do these videos again and I'll get even more, mm -hmm. and even more. And it's, it's been a very fun journey. And now our, our channels are very parallel because we're talking about the same kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I, I feel like you're a kindred soul. Um, I, beyond all of it, I can, I can feel the same yearning for knowledge and I recognize it. I know it very, very well. And I feel that same thing. So it's exciting to finally talk to somebody. If you go through all of your study notes, you've, you've read the same books that I have many, I have never talked about on the channel. Uh, you, you've talked about 48 laws of power. You've talked about dot com secrets and four hour work week, and you've really melded the metaphysical aspect going all the way back to the Kabbalion to the entrepreneurial aspect, which is going on today. And it's exciting to see your discussion of integrating these concepts. Clearly it all started at some point. There was a point where uh, you, you decided that, that, that you craved this information. Tell me a little bit more about that beginning point where you decided, you know, I, I really want to seek out this information and expand my knowledge on these subjects. You know, I was always a fan of communication and I felt that it was always for me something that I wanted to cultivate. I remember when I got into corporate, I printed off these uh, NLP documents mm -hmm. and they put these websites. This was back in 2000. There right. were these websites and they were like, you know, like texts, you pick, you print them out and it didn't make any sense to me what they were talking about, but I knew it was like really powerful stuff. Right. So I, I committed to myself that I was going to learn it. So I kind of like learned it a little bit and started to get into it because I was very fascinated about getting my mind to do the things that I know I wanted to do. I mean, that was like what I was very fascinated by. And that's the kind of stuff I used to always talk about growing up as well. But Think and Grow Rich, in 2004, I was in about $50,000 debt. And I had a circumstance reveal that debt because I had to pay off. Like uh, It was essentially like a, my tires got slashed. <laughs> oh. And we slashed my tires. But it was a blessing in disguise. And uh, that prompted me to look at my current situation because I, I managed to figure out the money thing to some degree, but I was spending more than I was making in corporate. So I realized that I found myself in $50,000 debt. So I got Think and Grow Rich. I read it. And that's when something started to, you could say, awaken within me. And this journey started to, this thread started to unfold where I realized that I actually always really liked learning and reading. And it was around that time where I developed a connection, a deeper connection for learning. Whereas growing up, I didn't really do well in school and I wasn't really interested in reading. 
but that's when it started. And then when it started and I started to go down the thread, I just kept reading book after book after book after mm -hmm. book. I remember one time it was New Year's Eve. It was 2000 and I believe it was 2005 or something like that. And uh, there was a book called The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. Oh, yeah. Something. And, you know, I just sat down on New Year's Eve uh, for whatever reason is I didn't want to make plans. And I just really wanted to commit myself to personal development and growth. So I was doing a lot of things that were changing the habits around that I was doing. So mm -hmm. I had this idea of New Year's Eve. I was going to read a book all the way through. <laughs> right. 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 That was the first time I sat down and read a book cover to cover. And it was kind of thick book. And, you know, I also discovered this inner desire for uh, a deeper level of the inner desire for entrepreneurship and stuff. And it just kept weaving and weaving. And, and here we are talking about Neville and uh, all kinds of uh, Kabbalion. It's, it, was a, it was a weaving journey, you know, it's just one right. thing the next. I call it identifying your true self. It's, because if I look at what happened on the journey, when I read Thinking Grow Rich, he spoke to me in a way that I really understood. Right. I, when I read the book, I just really understood. I mean, the book was Think and Grow Rich. Right. And at that time, I was like, look, I just want to get out of $50,000 debt. And I want to have this thing taken care of. And I want to move on to other things. But as I started to integrate the principles in there, it started to open up my mind. Like when he spoke about specialized knowledge, and he gave the example of Henry Ford and collaborating with others and stuff. It really helped me understand the value of uh, integrating different kinds of information. Mm -hmm. And that's when my mind started to open up to the different possibilities of integrating different kinds of information. And uh, one of the things that ended up happening was uh, I went to this program. And in that program, they talked about a guy named Jay Abraham. You know, Jay Abraham? Oh, yeah. Marketer, copyright, sell yeah. salesman. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the way they were talking about him was he's a marketing genius. So I checked out some of his stuff and I'm like, wow, this guy has this amazing ability to connect things together. And I was right. fascinated by it. He's like this connector and he can see things that other people can't see in the world of marketing and business. And I knew one day that I was going to meet him. And in 2000 and uh, was it 2014, I got uh, a call. It was an email actually from one of my clients and friends uh, who I actually met through my YouTube channel. And he introduced me to the Abraham group. And next thing you know, I flew down to LA and I was doing for two years on a TN visa, management consultant visa, doing some uh, operational oh, wow. stuff and some management consulting stuff with the Abraham group. And I got to be around Jay Abraham. And wow. Jay Abraham, like one of his core pieces of his philosophy is he calls it adapting and adopting. It's the idea of going into different books and concepts and industries. Like he's referring more to the business realm, but I saw it like with everything. Right. And, you know, borrowing principles and ideas and philosophies from different people, authors, industries, and integrating innovation. Mm -hmm. And so that is why my channel has gone through this uh, evolution. I believe you do that as well on your channel. Mm -hmm. That's why I really enjoy your stuff. I mean, you take all these great new thought authors, and my favorite as well, the new thought authors. And you just like weave all the principles together in a way that's like so relatable. So I'm, as I go... As I watch one of your videos, it feels like I'm going in this like psychological journey. I know you got a, a background in NLP as well. Mm -hmm. And I really feel Neville can do that as well. Like, I mean, you listen to his lectures. I feel every time I listen to any of his audios, I have a, a sh like a change in my mind. And it's more accurately put. I become more of who I am. There's definitely an integration. Clearly, it feels like there's some sort of higher level of very sophisticated knowledge that is deep in breadth. And each time we're just getting a little aspect of it, each time we read one of these books or get a lecture, and it kind of, you're probably like me, it kind of joins into this yeah. common thread. And there's a part of my brain that is always actively trying to coordinate and integrate and to deal with the contradictions of them and, and to understand how they assimilate together. And uh, it, it is exciting. I do see a, a, a thread that seems to yeah. run through even the oldest and newest books, there's this common thread and it expands. I see yeah. that with your work. You're, you're, you're not just studying the individual book, you're integrating all of it together, which is difficult for some people. You know, you, you read one and, and, and all these contradictory information, really it's not as contradictory when you start now, to- What I like to do is um, relate it back to entrepreneurship. So when right. I started this channel, it was like a place where I could share and discuss and help build entrepreneurs. 
mm-hmm. based on the way that like my journey, there's many different kinds of entrepreneurs, right? Right. And uh, then as I started to share the books and discuss, I also started to integrate it even more and learn and see the connections. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I discuss with mind maps, right? You see my right, brain. which is wonderful. That helps me integrate. Right. When I discovered mind mapping, this was back in 2005, when I took this course called Priority Manager, I, I kind of rejected it. But then right. later on, I had this opportunity show up where I started teaching speed reading for a company named Iris Reading. Mm-hmm. And I actually ended up doing some partnerships. And we still do partnerships. Like last, it was in 2018, we did about 16 flights and 30 days teaching this workshop. And part of the workshop is mind mapping, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, that's when I discovered XMind, the software which allows you to mind map on a computer. And I got back into it. And then I started to see that that's how we were forming connections. You know, it's like Mm -hmm. you take a mind map and you, and you read a book and then you plug information in and you plug information in and you see, you start to see the parallels and the connects and the connects and the connects and the connects. And you see that like everything is connected. And actually probably one of the biggest times where I realized that that was what was going on was in 2005 or six, I was going after a Cisco certification, which is an internetworking certification, because mm-hmm. that's what I did. I did 10 years in corporate IT, and then I did like these warehouse management systems and security and a whole bunch of integrating, and I was groomed by civil engineers. So it was all about like connecting the dots and process and systems and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And during that time, I was also reading some spirituality books. And when I read the spirituality book and I was reading the Cisco stuff, and I was, you know, reading them side by side, not literally, but like I was, you know, doing both at the same time. Uh, maybe in the daytime, I would study the Cisco stuff. And at the nighttime, I would read the spiritual stuff. I would see the parallels. Mm. So when Neville's talking about things or the philosophers are talking about how creation is complete and in a way we're not creating, we're going down a journey to the fulfillment. I'm, I'm reading all that stuff back then and I'm seeing it, uh, that the architecture, the actual technological architecture, I'm like, where do they get this uh, ideas of, of how to build this architecture? It's so precise. Right. And I'm looking at the spiritual stuff and they're saying the same things. And then I go up to uh, some of the, my friends who are very, very, very technical. Let's say they don't study the spiritual stuff for whatever reason at that time. And then also goes to some of my friends who are very, very spiritual. And although I see it as one, I mean, I really see it as one. Right. They, they didn't see how the technological stuff was the same, uh, vice versa. You know, the technological didn't see it, but I saw it and I was like, oh, there's a benefit to be able to look at, uh, to what would appear as polarizing the opposite philosophies and see the integration with it. Because when you can see it, it helps you traverse it. So when I bring it into entrepreneurship, I'm like, that's a very practical way of applying this stuff. I mean, yeah. you, I, I work with the Robert Dills model, right? Like it's like this. That's what I was going to say. I, you, you, um, I'm all about NLP. I wrote my master's on it. And I knew you were deep on NLP because you had an you episode. Really? That's amazing. You got it. You wow. have an episode on Robert Diltz. So, you like Robert Diltz? I love, I think he's the best of the NLP authors. You know, of course, I went I deep on Robert Diltz. I'm like, I got to watch more of his videos. Yeah. Um, I went deep on Richard Bandler, you know, and, and read about his the murder trial, but still at the same time, he's this amazing yeah, murder know, trial. There was, a mur- there was a Richard Bandler murder trial. He was accused of murder in mm-hmm. San Jose while he was working with the CIA, and he testifies in the trial. He testifies in the trial using when you read the court transcripts it's all nlp he's using so the people are coming out of the trial saying well i thought he was guilty but i couldn't there's no way i could ever declare him guilty and i, I was so fascinated by this i i, I you know but uh, nlp is this amazing thing to back up i wanted to talk a little bit more about the spirituality of entrepreneurship it's something that's come up a lot you know at you coach a lot and i have people come to me that uh that w- that when i'm talking to them almost every time the only way that i can help them to achieve their goals using the concepts you and i talk about is to have some sort of entrepreneurship to start your business to go out if you're stuck in some corporate job the number of options and alternatives you have to choose your future become somewhat limited, not every time, but I almost find that there is, there is a spiritual aspect in entrepreneurship that the opening of all the variables become available to you. Reality becomes much more faster. There's so much more of it, tools in your toolkit when you choose, okay, I'm going to go and make money on my own, starting my own business. 
not every time, but I wanted to get your, can you, it, it's much, much easier to utilize the law of attraction and transurfing and all of these ideas through entrepreneurship, isn't it? I think that there's a link. Yeah, you know, um, I'm a big fan of uh, principles and philosophies of what we call mental alchemy. Right. And what my, my understanding of it, to the degree that I understand right now, and paralleling it over to entrepreneurship and connecting back to all that we discussed is uh, the relationship of the inner world and outer world. Mm -hmm. So the entrepreneur, through the rearrangement of their mind, is able to look at resources, assets, as well as relationships, and be able to harmonize them in a way that produces something. You know, like right. look at all the technologies, look at anything in entrepreneurship. If we were to uh, develop that ability to see things from different perspectives, it would be easier to rearrange the mind. So the uh, pragmatic application of it is what we also call resourcefulness, traditionally in entrepreneurship, right? Which is like, mm -hmm. okay, here's capital. Here's a bunch of assets. Here are the relationships that we can work with. You give an entrepreneur, you put them in charge and away they go. One entrepreneur, uh, when they develop this inner world stuff, which is integrating this information, they will be able to rearrange their mind to be able to see the connects. So they'll actually see it. You know, All Russell right. Conwell in the book, Acres of Diamonds. Have you read that? Oh, yes. Classic. He calls it Acres of Diamonds. This is the, the, the mind is the Acres of Diamonds, right? Right. And so the Acres of Diamonds, when you recognize the Acres of Diamonds through the rearrangement of the mind, through thinking a certain way, through believing reality to be a certain way, will externalize as us being able to see the dots. And then we, we connect the dots. Right. So when we connect the dots, we produce product, service, yield. And we also practice this, which is essentially what Neville refers to the two gifts, right? The coin of heaven, he calls it. The gift right. of speech and mind. So we're working with mind. And we're working with imagination and speech. So look at the five sensory experience and rearrange it within so that we can we could say leverage or work with this. So that's how I see the parallels with this stuff. And right. we can practice. It's interesting because I'm, I'm excited that you did some study notes on it. People ask me, what's the best book I can read? Just what's the best book? And I say, four hour work week. Just go and read four hour work week. It will change that's your life. Yeah, that's four hour question. work week is spiritual. There's yeah, a really spirituality about it. There's a way of letting go of the material and, and focusing on your own life and kind of you can create a life that will give you the freedom that you want and still have abundance. And so I wanted to get, it's, it's cool to talk to someone else that, that, that talked about and read that book. How did that book influence your, your journey? Well, this is very much in parallel to what we're discussing because um, when I made that video, the living out of the backpack video, which is right. my first my channel, I put another video out, which was like kind of the backstory of the living out of the backpack situation. Because right. I, when I was transitioning out of my IT business, I was like, I got rid of everything. And then I went right. to Europe, to live in Europe, because I wanted to see what I wanted to do next. Now, um, what had started that, uh, entre well, it wasn't, I wouldn't say started, but one of the, one of the motivating factors, what stimulated me into leaving corporate uh, was two books, The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho, which was, again, talking about the stuff that we're talking right. about, and Four Hour Work Week, so I talked about it in there. And Four Hour Work Week, when I, when I read the book, when I went through it, it opened up my mind to different ways of looking at reality different potentialities, different uh, traditionally really of how does. I thought an entrepreneurship to be. It switched my mind around. Like he was talking about these high levels of efficiency and uh, doing things in a very creative way and looking at his mini retirements, all these things that yeah. maybe it's common uh, discussion now. I mean, one of his favorite books, yeah, exactly. what, like you said, is Vagabonding. That yeah, book. he's doing all this cool stuff, which I ended up right. doing. He's going out with a backpack and just living life not worrying about his um, house or car or, you know, there's something about it. There's something spiritual about it that allows you to create your reality in a different yeah, way. Look, and, and look, uh, for whatever the reason may be. Right. Uh, look at the reality that we're in now. I mean, you got Airbnbs. I'm staying at an Airbnb right here. This is two hours up north of Toronto and I get the snowboard, like the slopes, I can just literally go there. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. I'm, I'm Airbnb. When I go to LA or when I go places, I rent cars. Right. I rent these nice cars and rent nice places. Or if I want something that is a little bit more like, you know, every day, like right now I'm renting a car from Avis, which is, you know, day-to-day -day SUV type of thing. Right. We have the ability to do it. 
Like you could just have whatever you want. You don't necessarily have to own it. Whatever you that, want. That idea really stuck with me and it mm -hmm. still stays with me. And look what we got. We got Airbnb, we got Turo where you can rent cars. So that's mm -hmm. stuff that he was doing back then. Right. It's even easier to do it nowadays. You know? It's now easier. It's that we have a four hour work week economy now in yeah. many ways that we can, um, people don't realize. If you take the Neville techniques and apply it using the four hour work week, you can create a state where you're like, working four hours, but you're not just, um, but you're not poor. You're actually making an, an abundance of money and time. It's fun. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a game changer. It's a life changer. The n a next book I want, since I have you, is, uh, is 48 Laws of Power. This book was, is, is so deep and so powerful on so many different levels and really changed uh, everything, even on interactions and a, on, a, on a personal basis. I wanted to get your feeling about, once you read this gigantic book, how it changed your perspective of this stuff. Yeah, Robert Greene is like one of my favorite like deep thinkers. Really is. Mastery, even the book that he wrote with uh, 50 Cent, the 50th mm -hmm. law, I love this stuff. Because, you know, we grew up in a certain kind of environment where it was like a little rougher. Right. And you had to know, like the way we look now, the way we see it is we're the creator of our reality. We, we got up to this place where we're like, okay, we'll change our assumptions, our beliefs and the reality change. Right. During certain times in my life, it was like, you are the effect of all these things. You know, people were doing all these angles It sort of appeared at that time. Right. And these kind of books help you understand them. They helped you recognize so that you could, you could put yourself in this state of mind where you can transcend or ascend from it, which yeah, I think he even talks about. That was one of the reasons why he wrote that book, right? Right. Because he saw this stuff going on and he wanted people to know about it so they can be like, look, uh, this is what's going on. Right. That book was uh, very helpful for me, to, for me to recognize certain kinds of things. And, you know, when I, when I looked at, I was reading it when I was in corporate. When I saw those, you could say, maneuvers and stuff that were happening, right. it, it let you better equip to maintain that state of mind and then make the right move. Like you would just know what was happening so you can make the right move. Right. It's really just information for your journey. Once yeah. you're aware of it, then you can overcome anybody's manipulation, tactics, strategies, because people are always in their own reality. And when you interact with them, things like that just become a very powerful tool in many ways. I mean, think about how we got this information. When I grew up a certain way, I had a lot of disempowering beliefs. Right. And until this day, one of my favorite things to do is recognize what these disempowering beliefs are to myself, others, reality, so forth, and change them because we have the power to change them. We right. can work with affirmation, self-talk, revision, imaginal acts, like all these tools are available. And we can change them. And you didn't, I didn't know this back then. Right. But I was getting all these suggestions and I kept believing it to be that way. And that would affirm on my subconscious and I'd recreate it, recreate it, recreate it, recreate it. Right. And so... This, this journey has been, and I believe for me, it was meant to be this way because when I work with entrepreneurs, they're going through the same kind of stuff in some mm -hmm. degree. Like they're going through all these different things they got to navigate as they're creating entrepreneurial success. And uh, they want to be able to like understand what the different dynamics or the different pieces mean on their journey. So when I put together those, those selected book discussions on my channel, it was subconscious, you know, I felt it intuitively. But it was also intentional because I felt it was like a, a, a list of book, uh, books that would benefit the entrepreneur depending on where they are on the journey or anything that where they felt kind of stifled or frustrated about. And then right. lately, I would say about the last couple of years, I've been focusing more on the mind stuff because once we uh, get a certain grasp of, okay, this is what I believe in. This is what I don't believe in. Okay, this is how it came in and this is what I'm going to do about it. And then you change and change it and all this kind of stuff. And you move more into the internal locus of control. Then you're pretty much saying, okay, what kind of reality do I want to create? Then, you know, right. look like four hour work week. Like I want that. I can do it. So you look at it. So if you get to a certain level of, uh, let's say, uh, level of, of affirmation and belief in yourself, when you look at a book like four hour work week, you look at that and you say, that's what I want. Mm -hmm. And when you say that's what you want, it's what Neville also refers to as that is done, right? Now, what I believe, and I've been experiencing this since the start of the journey, which we're talking about start of the journey started way back in the days, but let's just keep it simple and say since thinking grow rich, he was talking about auto-suggestion. Right. Auto-suggestion impresses the subconscious and all these things started to happen, right? Right. And uh, so then it's like the subconscious mind 
does most of the navigating and the uh, everything else. And so when I put more emphasis on this kind of stuff now, then we can, we can start like where a person is on the journey, obviously, right? You can start with the mind and say, what do I want to create and assume it to be done. And then you can interpret the five sensory experience. Let's say entrepreneurial specifically can interpret the five sensory journey to the fulfillment of their entrepreneurial success by working with their mind and Robert Dilts model. Cause I keep it very simple. Right. And then with the Robert Diltz model, be able to go through all those book discussions that I put on my channel. And there's many other books that I have not discussed that are great books and say, OK, for a capability thing, this book is going to be helpful. You got Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. You got Slight Edge by Jeff Olson uh, for values and belief stuff. We got Joseph Murphy stuff, you got Napoleon Hill stuff. There's environmental stuff, you know, like the minimalism stuff or keeping things uh, where you we're keeping your environment in a certain way where you have a certain state of mind. That's uh, there's all these things kind of fit in and they all tie in together on the entrepreneur's journey. Right. So we got to talk about Neville and, and there's so much to Neville, so many lectures, so many books, so many different aspects of Neville. We got the early Neville, we got the later Neville. And so I wanted to get your feeling. You, you, you read those early Neville books and he's talking about the law. He's talking about imagination with some amazing techniques and literature. And then it just, it's like, uh, it kind of reminds me of, of the Beatles when they were like, you know, love me do. And they were, and then suddenly boing, they're doing Lucy in the sky with diamonds. Everything changed kind of the same with, with Elvis. You know, he used to be just love me tender. And then all of a sudden he's wearing crazy Neville Goddard is just doing the, all of a sudden, boom, something happens. He's talking about the promise. And it pretty much overtakes uh, a lot of what he's talking about later on. He's talking about these visions that he's having. And, uh, and uh, so <laughs> what, how do you integrate the, that stuff with the earlier stuff? And, and, and how do you utilize that? Do you understand what I'm asking? Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me um, uh, respond back on how I interpret it and continue to build upon it. Sounds good. Yeah. The good thread. I like it. Well, uh, in the start of my journey, with Think and Grow Rich, I just wanted to get a fifty thousand dollars debt, and it was done. So I got out, then bought my first house, done. Then entrepreneurial success. Oh, that was some. There was some stuff in corporate IT that mm -hmm. I wanted to rise up, and which was done. And then each each success that was brought forth was uh, Napoleon Hill refers to it definite chief aim brought forth. Right. I noticed a couple of things happen. First of all, you create the success, so that's very joyous. But a second thing is what I would refer to, and you probably heard me say this before: purification of the mind which is uh, the removal, either automatic or through conscious removal of the disempowering programming or, or interpretations of reality and so forth. Then what ends up happening is uh, like you change, like you more accurately could become more of who you are. So right. you become more expressive. You become like, in a way of looking at from the spiritual perspective, it's like your true self shines through you. So you might even find yourself talking about other things. Right. And when, when I started the journey on the YouTube channel, let's say, which was 2013, I was talking about certain books, but I would shy away from talking about certain concepts like infinite intelligence and subconscious mind. Right. Me too. And for whatever the reason may be, <laughs> but I know the reason it was because of this, what I would call purification of mind, removing disempowering beliefs. I started talking about it. I was like, okay, well, this right. is, this is what helped. So what were the, why was I holding back on talking about it? So I started talking about it. And, uh, and when I'm looking at my own journey, I was like, okay, uh, as I continue to go along on the journey, which is essentially, here's a de desire, bring it forth, definite chief aim, bring it forth, definite chief aim, bring it forth. You also uh, understand more of what I would call the subconscious realm, which I believe is an individualized uh, interpretation and based experience. And I felt ne Neville got to a, a point where he was sharing it, like he started talking about it. It's a natural progression. Right. Did you feel that way about your stuff as well? I did. I think what we, even the way we're dealing, you can even see the pattern of our videos. No, There's a natural like, progression, just like Neville's. And we start talking about the law and then it, it kind of goes beyond. We're talking about um, the mind on a different level and different levels of reality creation. So I think it's a, a natural progression, I, but I still find- One can say we became more open-minded. One can say we right. understand our subconscious mind and subconscious realm more. One can say we became more- of who we are, right? You know, uh, one of the things about that is uh, 
I also realize that through whatever this expression, which is based on experience, I also find that it's easier and more joyous to produce the results. There's more flow, more mm -hmm. autotelic, there's more fun. Right. And I'm noticing a lot more synchronicity. So people will say, you said the right thing at the right time. So I bet you during that time when Neville's around, like he was putting out that stuff with the promise, people were showing up going like, you know, Neville, this was the stuff I needed to hear. And look, when we're reading the promise and actually I'm, as mentioned on my upcoming videos, I'm going to talk about resurrection. Like right. that's getting into that kind of stuff. It's like, uh, I also related to what he refers to as the coin of heaven, which is from the Hermetica, which is we're given two gifts, speech and mind. Okay, mm -hmm. so we're given this gift of speech and mind. And the mind is filled up with the inner speech or imagination. And it is said that, uh, you know, we're, while we're here, we can create with it or experience whatever we're going to look at it from the unseen reality brought forth into existence. So we bring forth the heart desires which is whatever, the financial goals, relationship goals, all that stuff. Right. And helping others and all these different things that, that we desire to do. And uh, it's like a school. You learn how to use the, the speech in mind, right? Right. And then it is said that when you ascend from this life, you will take what you have learned and you'll go into, and his version is the promise. You know, and, and I've, right. I've seen many philosophers speak about it in different ways, which got me thinking. I'm like, Perhaps this world is so infinity that each person's promise is like individualized. Yes, that's what, you know I, what I mean. I believe that. I believe that it's not just Neville that happens. Everybody has their own little uh, variation. And, and the more I see that, that that's what's the beauty of creation. It's amazing. Like I was watching one of your videos the other day. Yeah. And synchronistically again, because everything just happens in flow. It's like you were talking about something where creating new worlds Something right. like that. I, mean, I got to go back and watch that in detail. <laughs> but when I was listening to it, even though you were not saying it the same way of how I believe it to be, it right. was parallel. It was, he's, he's talking about that thing. That thing that he's talking about is the thing that I feel within. Right. And you were talking about creating another world after this, or we are going to go somewhere and create a world or something like that. Right. Well, yeah, I, I, I really strongly believe we're kind of like in a, in a classroom setting. Yeah, and that's what I believe. It feels like we're learning how to think, how to, how to use our mind and how to create. And then we're just kind of in a creator's lab. We were dropped off here to go berserk. <laughs> right. So everything, it doesn't really matter. We're just learning how to create. And then as we, we're going to take these lessons, so the next level is an even more intense classroom on creation. Uh, I, I have this weird, I always have this weird dream that early on, God wanted to make everybody God, and it didn't work out quite well, because that's a lot of power. So, okay, I'm maybe going to teach you how to use this, because, you know, once you know, then you won't be destroying the universe and galaxies and stuff. You can, it's a step-by-step -step process. <laughs> I don't know, but it feels like we're learning how to use this power, yeah. and he desperately wants us to use it, but there's some lessons we have to, lessons of love, lessons yeah. of awareness, of focus, and attention, and um, you know, you know that's what I believe it comes down to it's that lesson of love. It, it, it does. Of the stuff that I'm talking about lately, because now I've been working with, I, I have experienced it with myself and I continue to experience it and continue to understand it more because I believe I can always understand it even more. Right. And then I started to integrate it into my consulting and my coaching and have my clients work with that same information, which was essentially revising how they see their team members and their clients and their right. staff to externalize the changes. I started to talk more about the concept of brothers and sisters, right? Like the brothers, we are the brothers. Right. And how, when we assume people to be a certain way, like they show up that way. So how do I want them to be? Well, I want them to be from a place of love. So you assume them to be from a place of love. And then all of a sudden you're surrounded by all these people that you enjoy being around. You do all these things, you have fun, yeah. you enjoy life. And I believe for me, that was part, that is part of the lesson. You believe that as well? I believe never that. This too. You, I, call, you called it molding this kingdom of ours. It's called the second man. By the way, I saw that video that you were you released on the new man. I didn't even know you had that lecture. I want to watch right. that. One. The new man. Right? Yeah, it's it, yeah. it does always seem to come back to love. There's some aspect of love that we're learning, and that love is much more complex than what we would initially think. It is this learn, ongoing huh? living intelligent force it seems to integrate itself into everything that we're doing. And it seems like everything's a lesson of love. 
our friends, our brothers, our families, our employees, the people we work with. Uh, so, and, and, and so, yeah, it just keeps on coming up over and over. I wanted to go back to what you mentioned there. The game changer with Neville is revision. It really is this game changer. You've seen it mentioned with some other metaphysical teachers, uh, you know, but the way that Neville talks about it, he's um, even using scripture to, to justify it. And it's a game changer. I use it all the time. And, 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 it, and it's, uh, you know, I have a bad sales day the day before. I just imagine that I didn't. Next day, I have double the sales I would have normally had. All evens out. I'm constantly revising and then, and then getting better at it. And I wanted to know about your experiences with revision and your, your opinion on it. Yeah, that's uh, one of my favorite concepts. And by the way, uh, I believe one of the reasons why I relate to him so well is because I grew up with the Bible. Like I had a Bible beside my right. bed to read it. And so these interpretations, they, they very much like, as soon as he says something, it evokes like a deeper level of understanding. Yes, absolutely. The repetition or, or whatever. But the, one of the things about the revision, uh, when I was in corporate, before I got into corporate, actually, that was a whole fun journey. It was, it was just such a joyous journey. It was, there was, you know, challenges and stuff, but right. you creatively use the mind and speech and you change it, right? Revision was one of them. Mm -hmm. I was actually given the knowledge on, on this particular, and I believe we all are. Before I got into corporate, there was a guy that just kind of showed up in my life and he was, you know, probably he was about 60 something years old and he mentored me and he would teach me a lot of these things. He, he started out uh, a very humble beginnings and moved into chief executive officer at a very prominent company. And uh, interesting, he just showed up in my life. And one of the last things that he said before he kind of went his ways and we didn't keep in touch, not for like any weird reasons, you just, you know, you just go on to right. do things, is that uh, he said, the greatest thing you can do in life, he asked me, he said, what's the greatest thing you can do in life? And so I gave him my answer based on what I thought at that time. And I was, you know, almost, I was almost 20 years old. I, I just turned 20. Right. He said, the greatest thing you could do in life is to turn an enemy into a friend. And then he started telling me stories of how he did it, and which was revision. Now that I look back on it, it was revision, mm -hmm. revision. He would interpret people to be different on his way up to the top. And that's how he got there. And actually, he told, he told me that the very last uh, a step from chief executive officer, he experienced a person that was so challenging for him. And he didn't run away from the challenge. He stayed with the challenge and uh, he saw him from a different perspective. And then when he saw that person from a different perspective, what ended up happening was that person changed. That person right. became his best friend. And then that person, when he, when he uh, finished his uh, you know, career, that person moved up to chief executive officer. It's, and, it's a real game changer. Um, an understanding of forgiveness being that, when you see somebody that you're mad at, you can, forgiveness is not just say, I forgive you. It's imagining them completely different. And, yeah. and, it, and it works, you no, know? And Neville said it one time in his lecture really well. He's funny too, right? Like he's got a sense. He of is. <laughs> he says, all day long, we're conjuring up people and they're not monologues, they're dialogues. And we're arguing with them. <laughs> right. And I'm like, gosh, we're doing that, right? And then... Then when you, when you slow it down or not slow it down, but you reduce it, you see less conflict. And then you're like, okay, there's some parallels here, right? right. So working with the revision, and I do this a lot now because for me, this is a, a big part of what I do, entrepreneurship. Right. And so much of entrepreneurship is about relationships, right? Right. So much of it is about relationships. And that's one of, the, one of my favorite opportunities to practice this art of revision. And to also teach and be able to share. I mean, clients show up and they're like, okay, I have this problem, I have that problem. Mm -hmm. And again, they're doing the same thing, the, the dialogue in the mind. And I, and I say, what within me is externalizing? First, I see, it, I, I see it from two perspectives when it comes to the revision. I see it as what within me is creating this theater that they're showing up and telling me that they're doing it because I know it's still within me, right? Like, right. Who's, who's, who's interpreting this reality? You're interpreting it from your perspective. I'm interpreting it from my perspective. So I can't say they got a problem. Like there's something going on within me. So I, I find what it is within me that I have assumed about them and that other person through the conversation. And I'll change it through inner voice conversations. I don't necessarily do the revision at nighttime formal way that Neville speaks. Right, right. I've done it. And it's very powerful because of the state of came to sleep thing. And, uh, and then I share with them, you know, I share with them like, okay, 
how about looking at it from this perspective or how to look at it? It'll, it'll like automatically come out from me as a result of uh, the repent or the, the, because what he's referring to revision, he's also saying it's repent, right? In the Bible, repent. He's saying right. that's what it is, radical change of mind. Radical right? change. So we radically change the mind. And then what, what externalizes from that? We know what to say, when to say, how to say, what to say, right? Right. And then, and then they come back and they report it. They're like, oh, actually the team member, I, I actually talked about this in the, the video I released on Sunday. Well, I don't know when you're going to release this, but the one I released on, I don't know what the date was, but that one I gave examples from an actual client who did that with a team member. And that team member appeared to be very persistently behaving dis, in, in a disharmonious way. But through the, through the revision, they ended up doing it. But I had to see it from two parts. I had to see it from, it was within me. Because otherwise I'm going to blame them, right? Like you think about this when we're coaching or consulting someone, if I, it's like someone jumps on, I mean, I learned this from the earlier stages of consulting. It was, this was a lot of fun too. The earlier stages of consulting, oh, this was good times. So somebody shows up, right? And do a lot of business consulting and uh, mostly, mostly sales and marketing stuff. So they show up and they usually the, the, the common for me was they want to go online with their business, right? So they have an offline business. You probably right. get that a lot, right? It's like, Oh yeah. And especially uh, I believe maybe it is still like that now. But I noticed that in the uh, early 2000s, like that was a hot topic, perhaps because not the early 2000s, but like after thinking Grow Rich, nothing Grow Rich, uh, Four Hour Work Week came out. Four Hour Work Week was, was a big motivator, yeah. So, anyways, I uh, ended up uh, ended up bringing forth these kinds of conversations, and in the early stages of consulting, I would propose them a solution. I'd be like, okay, here's the flow chart, and here's the funnel, and speaking about dot com secrets, it's like here's the funnel, and here's what you do, go do right. it. Right. And I'd look and I would, and I would have this, this thing in my imagination that at that time, and I didn't know that they had got a problem. So because I assumed that and I gave them this solution, they come back and they still haven't done it. Right. And I'd be like frustrated, but like, they're not doing the work. And then, I, then, you know, as I started to work with Neville's stuff and just through experience, the consulting, I'm like, there's something else going on here. Why is it that some consultants can create that behavioral change, the transformational change? And some don't. There's got to be something going on here that perhaps I'm not seeing. And then I realized it was their beliefs and assumptions because they believed, like Jay Abraham, and I put this in my synchronistic that we brought this up. I mm -hmm. put this in video. He always said, fall in love with your clients. Now you fall in love with your client and you're going to automatically say the right thing. You're going to know what to say, but you're also going to think the right thing about them, right? Right. You're going to reflect that. It's going to, and they're going to come back some way, somehow. And they're going to be like, they're either going to say that marketing strategy work, or they're going to say, look, that was a great conversation we had. And I've had like many different variations of this show up. They may say, oh, the marketing strategy was great. Or they may show up and say, you know what? That was a great conversation because I got a different insight and then it worked. Right. But it's always like moving forward. So that was a, a good way to apply revision and consulting. I didn't really take uh, inner conversation uh, as importantly as when I first started coaching, like you mentioned. And um, you realize... All those times you start imagining the conversation after you have a coaching call, then you imagine it and you start talking. You're still talking to them, <laughs> I know. right? You're still, you might be angry with them for something they said and you say no. something, you're still talking to them. It was like a big realization. <laughs> like every time I'm having those, those little conversations all the way back to when I was a little kid, I was actually talking to them because you, you know, you get into a fight when you're in high school, right? Or it's a verbal fight. And you're like, you go home and you imagine, oh, if I could have just said this, or I could have just said this to him and then you're saying it to him. You know what I mean? That's what it was hard for me with coaching is to really monitor my thoughts and conversation with everything. Um, Cause it has an effect. Yeah, it does. Right. The inner conversation thing is really powerful. The speech in mind, speech in mind, which is why I keep bringing it up because right. I bring things up in my videos for a number of reasons. First of all, I always like to share what I've uh, done that works and my clients have done that work, but I also want to affirm it more. Right. Like, as you as you make these videos, do you find that it affirms it even more? Like that's right. one of the greatest oh, benefits. It that I found. It's true. That? Yeah. One of the greatest benefits that I found from teaching is that you know it even more. You learn it even more. And I had many teachers who were in the space of coaching and consulting say this. I had mentors in the beginning say to me, "I could would consider you, would, you and I did do it actually because they said uh, consider while you are building your business mentoring." coaching and consulting on the side it's going to be very rewarding for you you're going to know what it means yeah and that was a that was a good uh, you could say a tip 
because uh, there's something to be said about if you share it with somebody, it creates this automatic accountability thing, an automatic affirmation. You want to live your philosophy. Right. And so, you know, all these other things that end up happening. And, you know, going back to what we're talking about, the revision thing, and uh, we were talking about Jay Abraham. Mm-hmm. I had an opportunity. I was able to acquire a client for Jay. And Jay's fees for one day is like $120,000 for his uh, consulting. Wow. And, you know, it's well worth it because you're talking about these big businesses going in there. Uh, right. They might be small businesses, but they're doing <clears throat> You know, they're doing things. And so they're going to get return on it because his marketing strategies are just next level. And uh, so he invited me down to New York. So I went in and got to sit in one of those consults. And it was such a great experience because I got to observe Jay having a conversation with the client. And not one single, and this is where I really understood this to the deeper degree of what I had put in that video of the self-persuasion thing. Mm -hmm. No matter what the client said, I never seen Jay flinch on the ideal outcome that that client wanted, not once. And I was like, okay, there's something going on here, right? Yeah. And the words were just flowing, they were flowing. You know, it's like, what did he say type of thing? It's like, it's what was needed to be said to produce the result. Yeah, what an incredible opportunity, man. I I can imagine. So um, I I also wanted to talk about reality transferring just a little bit, because you have a, um, a video on that. And yeah. uh, it's just interesting in relation to all the other stuff. Uh, some people could argue there's contradictions or there's definitely some different concepts that are not mentioned very often in these other books. One of the interesting ones that's kind of a game changer as you start to realize it is the pendulum. And so I wanted to get your impressions after reading it. It's probably, let's see, it's, it's been about a year since you did your study notes. So one of the things with transurfing is it kind of festers and grows like a, like, like, you know, one year later you start to, after you've had time to really look at pendulums and how it affects you and what's your impressions of pendulums now. And if anybody's watching this for the first time, a pendulum is a, essentially a, a, a group as people think about the same idea, a sort of energetic structure is formed uh perhaps it's conscious, perhaps it's not, that can take your energy and manipulate and influence you in the way that you create your reality. And a lot of other, Neville Goddard, a lot of these other authors do not talk about this unique aspect. And it feels real, it feels legitimate. Um, I've talked to people that started cowering in their homes and they were afraid of all the pendulums, right? So there, there's, there's sort of a negative that happens where it, people become overly paranoid. That book is written in, in that sort of Russian style which is uh, sort of be scared of the pendulums, but then, you know, maybe we can create our own pendulums as, as entrepreneurs um, and, and and they can become a positive. So what is your impression now that you've let this sort of become a part of your consciousness about, about pendulums? This is very much in harmony and in relationship to, uh, and I, and I studied reality transurfing to a certain degree and I love reality transurfing. It's a great, like it gives you the, metaphysical practicality you can say right. and then it leads you down a journey and uh, this was in 2016 when i saw there was on youtube a audio lecture on it. somebody was reading the book great voice too and i also saw the parallels between when i read a new earth by eckhart tolle he talks about mm-hmm. the pain body right so i saw some parallels there then you know tying it back to robert green in 33 strategies of war he talks about the concept of groupthink Right. And being involved with business and consulting, I could see how these, these structures would form. And right. then you'd go into this environment and then you would feel yourself kind of like reactive to it. So the, the concept of pendulum can help uh, put it into a conceptual understanding as to when you are identifying because Neville refers to it in a way, maybe parallel falling into the state, right? right. He says someone can have a prejudiced mind and then there was a lecture where he says that they can have a prejudiced mind and then you can fall into their state. And, and then you start to act that way. So the concept of uh, the way I relate to that particular concept is we're aware of it. I mean, you can feel it. You know, when you go into environments, I mean, can you feel it? I can feel it. I can see it. I can, can see, see it. it. Really? I, I can see it w- with people. Wow. I can see w- with their eyes. And maybe I'm overanalyzing, but I can see when, uh, if I sit in an airport, see people walking by, I can see pendulums walking by groups. Yeah. <laughs> when I yeah. look for it. Yeah, I can see it. 
Uh, when I've meditated, I, I can see what seems like waves of structures. I spoke to Frederick Dotson and asked him a similar question. And he says that he that they're like waves. When he, when he, when he can see the energy, it's like a wave that sort of forms. Um, so I want to look at it from two perspectives to, to contribute to that. Number one is yeah. uh, the part, let's say, would be undesirable. If a person's like one to maintain a state of flow or other state of mind, and they sense like the pendulum. I don't remember exactly what the steps were in reality transurfing, but my interpretation was you don't fight the pendulum. You like right. fall through it or dance through it or something like that. Like to me, I understand that that, that happens. Like in the business realm, you, you, you deal, you, you have all these deals moving and a lot of things happening. And you, you know, you, it's like. You have to uh, wrench yourself out sometimes. Is that what it is called? Uh, renting yourself out? Right. You just, you, you'll, you, you be a part of the pendulum, but you're not really a part of it. Right. The yes and in improv, right? Right. You know, I, I took improv classes a while back. That was very good because it, one of the things that she taught us was if you run out of something to say, just say yes and. And then you can always add to the conversation and build upon it. Right. So that's like a like a yes and type of thing, right? Like, right. Yes, pendulum and. <laughs> right, right. So uh, so that's that's one way of looking at it. And another way is you could say on the flip side of that, even it might, might not be on the flip side, but let's look at it like that, is... Um, I would not want to create a group think scenario because I want a individual, I want a true mastermind. I like Napoleon Hill's mastermind yes. where people come together and they're individualized minds and they're contributing and they're creating this, this third mind. If it's two people, they've got a third mind. It's a, a conscious a, pendulum that with positive benefit. I agree. Yeah. And, uh, and so, so what's been happened, what's happening in that mastermind is it's spirit of harmony for all and the collective. Right. And this is what I always aim to facilitate in if I'm doing some masterminds or doing some kind of group and from the management consulting experience, this is what that really helped me that uh, reality transurfing concept because as the, as the one, as you know, being the operating power of this reality, I got to take responsibility for it. So I take responsibility for that dynamic. And my goal is to ensure that we maintain that mastermind and observe at any moment if whatever the reason may be, it's falling into what we would call not the spirit of harm, right? So we can look at it from those two perspectives. Right. And looking at it from those two perspectives can really benefit us depending on what we're aiming to do. Yes, that I appreciate that explanation. And it's interesting. I love how you bring in Napoleon Hill because he is talking about pendulums before transurfing, but he's talking about creating one. And the mastermind really is- <laughs> I never one looked at it like that before, but you're right. It yeah, is. that's what I'm realizing right now. He's talking about actively creating a pendulum that, you know, when you have three people talking about a problem, it's like a hundred. It really is. It feels like it. I think masterminds are one of the real secrets, the most powerful thing. We, you and I talked a little bit about Think and Grow Rich in our first conversation. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so much to it. I'm such a huge fan of so many of his books, but the mastermind is something, even if you participate in a mastermind for a couple of weeks, you'll notice a difference. You'll get ideas. You'll have things, people start contributing. Uh, it's really one of the most effective techniques. Now you talk about uh, the, the hidden council, the idea that we can have a council of people that are a, kind of a secret mastermind that, uh, that, that Napoleon Hill also talks about not actual people that you're talking to. Um, he would have a mastermind with Abraham Lincoln, different people that, uh, that were close to him. And I do this all the time. I have my mastermind, I, you know, Steve Jobs. Council? Right, I do have my council. I, and, uh, and I even created a meditation around it. And I've had some amazing insights come from those people that are figments of my mind. As, as Napoleon totally acknowledges, yes, I know these are in my imagination, but they're real to me. You know, when I'm taught, when I hear Abraham Lincoln talking um, to me, and when I ask Abraham Lincoln, what should I do with this? It, his suggestion is filtered through Abraham Lincoln. It's powerful. It's not something I would have thought about. I wanted to know how you, how you utilize that particular idea from yes. Napoleon Hill. When I first came across that concept, I didn't really understand it. But to some degree, I was, I knew I was integrating it. Nowadays, I integrate it a lot more. Mm -hmm. And I integrated it in the following ways. I got the invisible council, right? my higher self. I got Joseph one, Joseph two, Joseph three, which is the three versions of myself. We can talk about that if you like. I, right. I share it with my clients. They really like it to help them 
uh, identify what's going on and be able to find the accurate meaning so they can move forward, as well as infinite intelligence or God or Jesus or whoever we would like to speak to. Right. And so the way it happens for me now is it's automatic. So I maintain flow. And one of my biggest things that I always shared on my channel, which I encourage for me, it's been one of the biggest contributing factors is the idea of maintaining a, a state of flow. It doesn't necessarily mean like a peak flow. Mm -hmm. No, like a certain level of like, I call it it's lighthearted. It even says in the Bible, it says, uh, you know, childlike, being childlike. Yeah. So I maintain a, you know, this childlike flow to the best of my ability. And uh, at any moment I can have these inner voice conversations. And sometimes it can be, people like James Allen, usually it's, I usually tend to do a lot of invisible counsel with Neville, James Allen, Napoleon Hill. Right. And, you know, I've, I've spoken to others as well. I mean, I've spoken to uh, world leaders. I've spoken to just, it just like, it kind of just happens. It happens. I used to look at it from the perspective, like I got to carve out a time to do it. And certainly that's how it was articulated and think we're rich and it does right. work like that as well. But for me, it just spontaneously shows up. Like I will be uh, doing something. For me, it tends to show up after I come back from my morning routine and I take a shower. So the invisible council happens in the shower. Another thing that happens is like, I always have a connection with my, what I call the true inner voice. And the true inner voice sometimes speaks real time. Like as I'm having conversations with you, I heard it a few times. And yeah. it says, say this and say that. And uh, it always speaks in a spirit of harmony. This is like, there's some discernment, there's some distinctions of what I would call this true inner voice. It always speaks in the spirit of harmony of benefit for me, others, divine and evolution. That's how I interpret it. Mm -hmm. So if I'm identified with a mental chatter type of thing, this true inner voice shows up and says, well, that's one way of looking at it. How about looking at it this way? And I'll be like, whoa. And then I'll identify a new belief, a new assumption, a new perspective. And yeah, I mean, it shows up. And so another time where I do invisible counsel, which again is not formally setting it up that way. Right. And it could be in that particular time, infinite intelligence, higher self, uh, Joseph one, Joseph two, Joseph three, or an invisible council is when I'm driving lately because mm -hmm. I'm up north from Toronto about two hours. One of the things that I do, this is kind of a ski snowboarding area, is uh, I go for a drive on the on Saturday. I'll go for a long drive. Mm -hmm. and there's, there's a lot of inner voice conversations going on. There's a lot of uh, invisible council going on about talking about a lot of things, you know, talking about what's going on in the business with clients, how to interpret things, what to put in the videos. And it is like so much fun, so much fun. Yeah. The uh, interesting thing about this was there was a book that I read in 2018, which I did a discussion on called How to Be Your Own Best Friend. How to Be Your Own Best Friend. When I read that book and I integrated the principles in that book, that further facilitated this inner voice connection of the, of the relationship with the invisible counsel. Uh, mm -hmm. principle let's say and uh because before that i still had within me this uh times where i would feel like i had to do it with somebody like i had to have a physical mastermind right. and i value it as well because i do and there are times where i can benefit from the invisible council and after integrating that principle i started to build this deeper relationship with the i call it the subconscious realm i believe there's like a subconscious realm subconscious world and for each person they got to go in and, and have and i've got a relationship with the subconscious right. and i've had many interesting experiences regarding that but uh one of the things that facilitated this is one of the key things that really facilitated the power of the invisible council was the feeling that i was never alone i don't mm -hmm. feel like i'm alone no matter where i am i don't feel like i'm alone whereas before that was one of my things i always felt like i uh, had to be around people and now it's like a preference like sometimes i'm around people sometimes i'm not but either either or it's like i'm by myself nothing happens i'm by myself invisible council or i'm with others and we're you know having right. conversations doing whatever having fun so the the it's interesting to watch the evolution of your channel and the you, you, the your focus even with our conversations on the flow state i, th I believe that that science may come to a better understanding of this flow state. Yes. Uh, you know, s studying skiers, snowboarders, s um, parachuters, there's something that happens when you let go, when you're deeply in the moment, Eckhart Tolle, there's, there's a connection you have with the, that ongoing inner presence, that opening moment that uh, is so powerful, it goes beyond 
any state that we can create it, it there's a perfection and purity in it and even if you've experimented with all these other meditations once you're in that sweet present everlasting moment when flow starts to open up and you don't have to do anything you don't have to sit down and do your meditation there's no there's no work that you have to do it's that free joyous moment uh i think that it's something that they'll more and more study the way the brain accesses this flow state it's a game changer as well um yeah. and and so yeah. uh and you know uh, there's a couple of books that i always recommend one is uh flow by mihai chiksent mihai and the other one is uh the rise of superman by stephen uh Kot and stephen Kotler actually talks about the neurotransmitters and stuff right and, and flow so one of them is uh, anandamide you heard about that one i haven't well anandamide is a uh, so it comes from a sanskrit word called uh, sanskrit word ananda which means bliss right okay we got this release that binds to i believe cb1 or cb2 receptors which is the same receptor that uh, and i don't know this like accurately as far as science goes but i believe thc and cbd from marijuana binds right. to it as well and uh, this this uh, neurotransmitter is released when we're in flow and it creates a sensation of bliss it, it does we feel bliss and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's released as well. And, um, you know, I, I went on this interesting uh, journey of realization about flow. But when I look back, in, it was in 2017, I was in Playa del Carmen, Mexico. And I was just on vacation. I was there for a couple of weeks. And I had, this, I had this instant reflection. I mean, when I go to Playa del Carmen and I'm in this kind of, <laughs> it was like inner voice conversation. There's certain environments that facilitate that inner voice. And it's like so clear. Mm -hmm. so the inner voice is so clear and I had that and the question was if you look back at your life and I was making videos and putting stuff out and I wanted the channel to grow and I wanted others to benefit from this but I also wanted to uh, go deeper into my experiences so the question was if you look back at your life and the journey of creating success or bringing forth what you desire when were the times where you had the most signs, synchronicities, flow, mm -hmm. results, not, not flow, but results, happiness, joy, creativity, all those things that we want, where you were the most fun, joyous, you were the most social, all these different kinds of things. And when were the times when you're not? And then right away, the word flow came into my mind. Now, I, I read the book prior to that. And, you know, like you read a book and you might not integrate it right away, just like right. the mind mapping thing we're talking about earlier. But at that point, it was it just stood out for me. And I said, well, I'm going to make a commitment, radical change of mind. I'm going to stay in flow. I'm going to, I'm going to get in flow from this day. Mm -hmm. I'm going to figure out all the things that bring me into flow, quote unquote, break the flow, because the breaking is happening from within based on interpretation, right? So right. Mm, per se, it doesn't necessarily break the flow. We are interpreting it that it breaks the flow. So right. I went on a, this whole journey. And it didn't mean that right from then and there, I stayed in flow. It was like on and off, on and off, but I stayed committed to it. I started putting in my affirmations that that was the priority. And that was in 2017 summer. And here we are, 2020 winter. So what I noticed from maintaining flow, and there's different levels of flow. So I don't see it as this like peak flow, which is right. a lot of times uh, studied when it comes to the, uh, the whole uh, like, you know, when you study a surfer or whatever, they get into this like zone. I can get into it. There's certain things that I do. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty into it now because I love this kind of stuff. Right. If I do public speaking, like live events, like really into flow. If I get into, I don't know, like just a bunch of things, like house music brings me into flow. Right. And so there's certain things that bring me really into flow. And then there's a certain like kind of baseline of flow. And then uh, there's a point where I would say I get out of flow which is when I start to experience overthinking or right. mental chatter, as I call it. And I was able to discern what this is and what it's not and, and, and just kind of study myself and then integrate it as well in, in my coaching and consulting and in my videos. Mm -hmm. And as the years went by, I was finding myself maintaining this either a baseline or a peak flow, baseline peak flow. And it was enormously beneficial for me as compared. I mean, I was feeling great. I'm feeling great. Right. And also, I noticed that the areas in my life that are very important to me, I am who I am in those areas. Because for me, when I was building my IT business, I had periods where I was considered very serious. Like I was just kind of like, this has got to get done, like very serious. And if I were to hang out with friends or go out with my girlfriend at the time, it would take me a while to loosen up. Right. 
like sometimes it would take like hours for me to loosen up and I'd be like kind of critical. And you know what? I was like, I don't want to be that way. That's not the way I want to be. I want to just be like, look, I did a, a bunch of things. I made a bunch of moves. Now we're having fun. Just boom, right into it. Right. And I realized that by maintaining this like baseline and peak flow thing that I'm talking about, it's easy for me to do that. Right. For example, when we can have this session and I got a client call right after it, I'll boom, right in the client call. And then right. I'll go for a run right after. And if some friends call me up, they're like, let's hang out. I'll go and hang out and it'll be like complete flow. Right. And uh, that was, uh, that's one of the reasons why I encourage it because, and then not only that, the KPI, so I'm a very KPI based person mm -hmm. where I, I measure everything. I track everything. And the numbers started going up and all the, the business goals, the fitness mm -hmm. goals, whatever goals I set, like uh, hunches and inspirations, creativity, everything started to happen faster, which was, based on the reflection anyways because when i look back on my journey i was like that's when it was uh when it was happening more and this is when it was happening less now i can't say that's going to be like that for everybody but certainly the clients that i bring forth because i believe you know we believe this as well i believe that student student brings forth the teacher right and the teacher brings forth the student and i, I absolutely. believe the student and teacher are one mm -hmm. i believe they're one like you know i'm learning from you from this call right and you're learning from me. Absolutely. And it's, like, it's like one, like this is mastermind, right? And a student teacher is one. So I bring forth the students that want to know about this kind of stuff because they want it. Because a lot of them will be like, look, I've been out of the flow. I need to get back in the flow because I already know what to do. I already know what to say. I just need to get back in the flow because when I'm in flow, I'm on. Right. They make the moves. They do what they say. Their sales go well. There's no friction and, and they listen to their inner voice. They have right. a connection with their intuition. So I, I bring forth that, that kind of uh, dynamic in, in, as far as uh, the connection goes with clients and so forth. So the way I tie it, possibly, you could say. sorry, I keep on interrupting. I apologize. The, the, the way I tie it um, together, you create your chief definite aim. You do the work where you, you imagine it in, in rich detail and then let it go and follow the flow. The flow is where all that stuff is happening. Your chief definite aim is in the flow. Once you're in the flow, it's like a script opens up and you're following it and, and you just forget about the chief definite aim. Every single step in the flow is taking you towards that your your the chief definite aim that you want. If I want to, if I have my chief definite aim and I want to follow it, it's in the flow. Uh, even they say that in reality transfer, the alternatives flow, that what they say. the alternatives flow is a chapter The easy. Usually it's the, the, it'll give you the easiest options. And I'm pretty sure Neville said it as well. Cause one time I heard him say, and you do this and you do that, and you do this and you do that. And then it ends up happening. It's the like bridge that. of incidents is the flow, right? Yeah. It's the bridge of incidents that's happening. You're just letting go and moving into that script. It's script that's all basically created for you. And a lot of times I think people are struggling to reach that chief definite aim is they, they know what they want, they have it, but they won't go into the flow of, of the script. They won't jump into the river stream that's taking them right to where they want to go. They're paddling up river. So, um, yeah, you know what, when I reflect back on my journey, I realized that for me, the friction was created on a couple, a handful of things. Number one is I, for whatever the reason, I didn't believe it was done. You know, when Neville says, assume it to be done, it's right. done. So it's easier for me to now believe that because I know what it means as a result of bringing forth. Right. And also uh, tuning into it and discussing it a lot. But for many others, they might not know what that means. Like, you know, right. I'm, I'm, I'm reading Think Grow Rich back in the days. He says, he says, put these auto suggestions in there and, uh, and away you go, it's done. You know, there was a part of me that's like, okay, this is not, uh, how could this be true? I mean, you can just speak yourself into this kind of stuff and all this stuff, but I did it anyways. And um, well, I did experience like friction on the journey, but if I would say that if it wasn't flow to that end result, the friction was caused by my interpretation of the five sensory experience from a couple perspectives. Number one was that I would interpret it as, Okay, this is happening here, and therefore I'm not going to get the goal. So then that breaks right. the flow as well, right? And then another thing is uh, maybe I'm like, I feel like a void. I'm like, why isn't it here now? I want the end result now. So that would break the flow as well. But, you know, you learn these things on the journey that these are interpretations that is, right. that is creating this, this uh, I call it uh, unnecessary convolution and complexity because here's the thing. In the entrepreneurial journey, myself and from working with clients, they'll start to do all these, like they'll create all these other projects 
right? As a result of the un unnecessary complexity and convolution. You know what I mean? And you know what? I, I'm, and it's not like I'm not making fun of them or. or it's natural. It happens. This is, we gotta go. We gotta learn this. This is the con this is the journey we're all on. Right. To work with the conscious, to work with the gifts of speech and mind. You know, it's like mm -hmm. we're we're all learning these things, and we're the brothers and sisters. We're helping each other, and this right. is why it's so great that. Now we got YouTube where everybody's talking about their own perspectives and so forth. So people can listen to it. They can listen to it and say, you know what? That resonates with me. This guy's resonating with me. What she's saying is resonating with me. And I'm going to integrate it or do what actually Neville's like core piece of this philosophy is put it to the test, right? Put it to the test, right? Because all the stuff was like putting it to the test. We put it to the test, right? Right. We put it to the test. And, uh, and you know, and we always aim to put out content and discussions and collaborate in the spirit of harmony. So, because this will happen. I mean, I'll, I will have a conversation with somebody, a client. Mm -hmm. And I said, did you assume it to be done? They're like, yeah, I know it's done. So what's, what's going on right now? And they're like, here's this tension, tension, tension. I said, what do you, what do you interpret about it? They're like, it means that I might not get to the, the goal. And I'll say, <laughs> well, that's one of the, the interpretations. Uh, uh, what is happening as a result of it? And they're like, well, I'm doing this, this, and this. I'm saying, so if you never interpreted that thing, you wouldn't do this, this, and this, right? Right. And like, yeah, I wouldn't do this and this and this. I'm like, what if you uh, reinterpret it? So I'll give them an affirmation or a different perspective of looking at this. By the way, this is what we do in coaching and consulting, right? Right. The phone's been doing this for, for, for decades, right? It's like you sit down with a client and they're looking at it from some perspective. And then you share with them, with them another perspective. They're like, oh, yeah, okay, I got it. Right. They release, they get back into the flow. Right. So, I'm a collector of routines. And yeah. so when I, when I, um, even with your YouTube channel, I want to get an idea, a feeling for the Joseph Rodriguez routine. When you wake up in the morning, when you go to sleep, if you meditate at all, how you meditate, when you work, how often you work, when you play, just give me an ideal uh, idea so I can steal your routines. What, what is it you're doing? The, the routine is based on one emphasis, maintaining flow and fun. That's what it is. It's about having fun, flow, right. and, and allowing uh, my, my litmus test is what I would say, how, how loose I feel like I want to, I want to, I want to feel lighthearted and I want to have that inner voice, that connection. And, and I want to, I want to feel if I'm being tense with anyone or anything. And my goal is to, to calibrate and adjust. So this routine is based, was built on the foundation to facilitate that, facilitate that because from there, all these things tend to fit in nicely, right? right. Uh, like the things you got to do to produce results and whatever else, uh, the goals, fitness goals, working out, all, whatever. So it's all there. So the way I have it is Monday to Friday, and I can change this, but right now this is the current based right. on uh, what's going on, is uh, I wake up and sometimes it's five, sometimes it's six. Usually nowadays it's six for this particular stage of where I'm at. I wake up and I do a morning routine. So I, first thing I do is I'll read my affirmations brings me right back into flow starts to because I wake up and I'm like you know where am I type of thing get back into flow go to the bathroom brush your teeth and by the way I have an electric toothbrush right so one of my goals is to find joy in the littlest things for me that was very important to me I learned that from power of now and other mentors that I met in my life the importance mm -hmm. of being really present so I have an opportunity to be present when I'm brushing my teeth and so you know I'm, I'm present to it and I'm saying you know you know, joyousness and whatever else in my mind, gratitude. And then I'm getting back into the flow again. So then I maybe have a coffee, but I have uh, about a liter of water because I feel great. I read somewhere that hydrate yourself, you feel great. So I did that for many years. It's been my thing. And then I go to the gym, I go to the gym. You know, I'm always in the, into the fitness thing. So I'll do it. I got my, my logging, my workouts and all these things that I'm a fan of. And then after that, uh, I will meditate for about 20 minutes and the kind of meditation that i do is considered vipassana style mm -hmm. so all i'm doing is just focusing on the air going in and out of my nostrils and that, that just um, calms my mind my mind is pretty calm because of the flow but uh i get even more i could say present and um, perhaps deep moments where there's nothing i don't know right the alarm goes off and the next thing you know i wasn't sleeping but the awareness right. pours back. At least that's how I describe it. Usually I get some pretty cool insights. So I want to add more things. So when I'm at the right. gym, I post on my Instagram because I get, when I, I have the inner voice conversations going and I get insights when I'm at the gym and stuff. So I usually end up posting on Instagram or taking notes of things to discuss. 
in the videos or, or things like that. I'm, I'm inspired by different experiences. And uh, after the meditation, I come home and I have a good breakfast and uh, take a shower and then I get started. So my style of doing things right now is I don't like to do more than six and a half hours of uh, work per day. Mm -hmm. My goal is to get more yield. And I always achieve my goals. And for the reason is I, I have a way of thinking that it's not about doing more, but it's about creative use of mind and creative use of resources and creatively working with relationships and combination to get the yield right. in the various business activities. So, and I got to do the things I love to do as well. So what do I love to do? I love having calls. I love doing things like this. I like making videos. I like uh, reflecting upon different like business strategies and stuff like that, consulting, things like that. Right. And everything else is automated, <clears throat> delegated or eliminated. And, uh, you know, this has been a journey to get to that. And I set up my work day in a way that it's like, I use my calendar a lot because, you know, we book the time and everything. So right. I work within a schedule. And uh, at the end of the day, which sometimes like some client calls are uh, 6 p.m., very few, but I prefer if they end at 6. But for these, I made the exception, which joyously uh, so because I wanted to have these conversations at that time. Uh, after that, I'll go for a 30-minute run. And where I'm staying right now, there's a beautiful park. But right now it's all full of snow, so I'm going to be uh, going to the treadmill. And uh, 30 minute run, and I usually listen to James Allen as a man thinketh, or another audio I really like is Heavenly Life by James Allen. And that's like a, um, I would call it like an active meditation. I call that an active right. meditation because what it does is it, like, I love what I do. I get so into what I do that um, it could still be running in my mind. Like it's just like going in a loop. Right. And during that active meditation, I'm listening to James Allen. It's like it just goes away and brings me back into what he calls the divine center. Like brings it centers me. And then after that, I just do whatever I feel like doing, whether it's snowboarding, longboarding, hanging out with friends, wherever. And uh, then I go to sleep. I maybe watch a couple of YouTube videos and go to sleep, wake up, do it again. And right now, Saturdays and Sundays are off. So again, Saturdays and Sundays, you know, I got things to do. And, um, and again, the, the base, the, the thing is always maintaining flow because right. I find that when I maintain flow, all the goals are brought forth, uh, the sessions with clients and all the other business stuff that I do goes really well. The videos are very, uh, flow based, uh, my insights and my ability to gather the information together and, and discuss it and the way of life and everything just happens like that. So that's how I do it. Thank you for sharing that. And we could probably talk all day we could probably sit That's and so talk I, for the whole entire day the conversations, yeah. we, so but the, ask, um, i want to ask you so you, you yeah like, i want to ask you a couple of things Can I ask you, you got it all right so i mean you've been an entrepreneur for a while right? yes what was your what was your business prior to this is a business that you're doing right i i well one you're... of my fundamental things that i have learned in business is is multiple sources of income is yeah. incredibly important and as much passive income as possible. Yeah. So uh, I was in the mortgage, I was in corporate like you, I was in corporate in a, in a mortgage job working for GMAC for a long time. Remember Ditech, the advertisements, I would, I would, uh, you know, Ditech was a, you know, uh, so I would, I was in sales, I would, I could sell anything. I was NLP or, you know, um, and I got to a point where selling some stuff I didn't really like selling. I could sell anything. I could sell, I could sell a toothpick to you. Uh, and I could sell, you, you know, right? you know, I, I, but I had this, this moment where I was like, N I'm selling these mortgages. They're so bad. You know, the rates are going to go up or I need to do something that is right. I need to be helping other people out. I need to be t using what I do in a positive way. So the next thing I wanted, it was my fascination with books at the time. I had yeah. a gigantic book collection. And so I quit my mortgage job and I was like, I'm not going to do this business even more, I I even though I'm good at it. And it, it's a little scary and I don't know what I'm going to do. So I had uh, at the time, huge DVD collection, game collection. So I started, okay, I got to sell my stuff to pay my rent to start. So I started doing that. And then I start selling some books and then some, sometime along I was selling an eBay or Amazon. Somebody bought something for me. I couldn't find it. And then I started searching for it in other places. And I, oh my goodness, I found a place I could buy the book and still make the profit. And so then I started, oh, oh the, the light bulb went on. I can go and I don't actually have to own the object to sell it. Mm 
So I could become like a, a, a sort of arbitrage occurred uh -huh. where I could, somebody buys a book for me. I can have, I can order it from someone else, still make $2 profit. And I started expanding my business, finding ways that I could sell stuff that I didn't actually have an inventory. And, and eventually using that expanding, I started my own bookstore. And, you know, I, I um, and, and that was going um, for quite a while and it gave me the freedom. Uh, was offline bookstore? What's that? Offline, like, as in, a, in an bookstore. online bookstore uh, that sells through a number of different places, eBay and a books and, and uh, Amazon. And, um, and so that was great. And, and, and through that, I got access to a lot of books and just did that I would never have gotten. You, you start, when you start selling every single book becomes a, you, you start just accessing stuff that you'd never heard of. I'm just a book lover at heart. It's very difficult for me to move when I move house to house because I have so many books, if you, just the, just a huge collection. So, um, but then it was just like, uh, but it was very difficult. I was doing all the work. I was doing all the work. I'd do the order. I'd sit there for 16 hours and I couldn't trust anybody else to do my work being an entrepreneur. And then that point where, okay, I, my definite chief aim is to, to work, do this same business, but have other people found almost instantly people that could do the work that I could do. Next yes, thing you know, I'm <laughs> next thing you do, everybody's doing the work I was doing and I'm not doing any work. And I'm just like, wow. So, um, but you know, that, that is, I'm also dependent on that business. So I constantly am saying, okay, this is great. I have one business. I want to have another. So it's not really just being self-employed. It's, it's freedom to me. And for me to find freedom, I need to have multiple sources of income so nice. that if I am not depending on one um, and, um, and also time, I'm a little bit different than you. I, time is so valuable to me. I, 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 I don't like to coach as much. Um, <laughs> I, it's uh, when I coach, it's rare circumstances because it's a time and it, it, I have somebody that genuinely wants to be coached. Um, but yeah, yeah. I thank you for asking that question. It's uh, I don't really talk about the self-employment part of on my, my channel very much, but it is definitely part of my journey is that once I started my business, I could instantly start to test like Neville Goddard. I could test on a daily basis. I could start imagining I make this much on this day and it would happen within a couple of days. I'm not wait, waiting for a raise from my boss. I could constantly see the way that my mind was interacting with my money in, in such a rate. Then I became so fascinated. I, I started reading about it and then I started having to share it, you know, um, very similar to your journey. Um, that multiple streams of income thing. Yes. Is uh, automatic when working more for me anyways and for many yeah. regarding w working with this information because we transcend then from the linear ways i mean right i've also got multiple streams of income and even some recurring revenue sources from my IT business data. right and i even tend to get money like given to me and stuff like that like they always end up achieving the specific number but it's never enough I always continue. If I have 10 sources of income, well, I probably need 11 or 12. Um, so it, it's something like, cause it's easy for me to just get super lazy. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there is a part of, there's Brian number two. Idea of uh, multiple streams of income and business building. So entrepreneurship is like, it's a, it's like a, a fun thing that you, I'm like that as well. Like yeah. I have a lot of fun doing this. I mean, this is who I am. And there's many ways of earning money. Many ways. That there is. This entrepreneurial pathway is, one where it's for me who I am. Right. And it is, seems like it is who you are. It is. It and really is. Many are also on the journey of discovering that this is part of them. Certainly I work with many that, and I was also at a certain point. And uh, what I found is, is when we allow that side of us to be expressed by removing, let's say we, uh, for me, I had disempowering beliefs. Like I couldn't, right. you need this, you need that and all these things then all of a sudden these creative ways of bringing forth just show up. They just show up. Screams, and then you pick and choose the accurate amount. So for example, like your channel is growing pretty quick. You know, my channel is, uh, and when we're looking at that, I get a lot of, uh, I, I, there's a lot of ideas. And a lot of people say, why don't you do this? And why don't you do that? Right. And here's the thing about this is like, I gotta have fun with what I do. So exactly. you don't have to do those things. It's not like how I was before back in the days where I was like, I felt that uh, if I don't like grab it, then I'm going to lose it. 
because I know they always show up and that's an assumption. That's a belief. You know, that's one of the things I learned from Neville. It's like, you can uh, assume it to be a certain way and will it show up that way? So you keep changing these assumptions around. Right. And it ended up happening. So these, uh, the, 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 the living in the end, it's like, okay, you know, it's done. And then whatever shows up on the journey. And that's why I wanted to ask you, because I'm like, I know this guy's living it. I mean, I'm looking at your videos that you're putting out and, and the, what you're talking about and like how fast your channel has grown and, you know, how much your audience loves you. And, you know, you, you provide a great service too. It's like, you bring all these connections and these philosophies together and people are forming a lot of connections. I'm looking at the comments. It's like uh, people are, are receiving, you're, you're speaking the same inner voice that they have and they have someone to share it with. So, well, it's exciting. Of- I think you and I are like, as I said, in our first comment, I think you and I are from the same planet. <laughs> we have a deep so desire to learn. The theories we ascend and we go into wherever we go after with that's going to be like, the, the planet of you and I. <laughs> right. That, there's a planet where there's a, where, where uh, we seek information, we're researchers, we're learners, we're of the mind. I feel like we're of the same planet. I do. You know, that's so interesting. That's, that's very interesting because I, I, I don't know if you were like, uh, Neville said this in one of his lectures. I got to go back and listen to it because he's got so much great stuff. I haven't gone through a, a large percentage of his stuff. Right. One of his lectures, he talks about you know, being restored. You ever heard of that one? Like he's right. like, like people were in this world and um they didn't know that they died or something like that and they were just going about doing their thing i could talk and, to you about that that's one of the weirder things his whole afterlife perspective and so i'm like <laughs> wait all these things that i'm doing now i want to do all these things and i have so much fun of what i call purification of the mind i call it purification of the mind which is the removal of the disempowering program because every time i right. remove there's like things happen, things that I'm consciously wanting to happen. And these like miracle type of things happen. It's the removal that is more powerful than the integration of a new belief. It's the release of the old beliefs. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I, li- I like that. I like that. And then, uh, and then, so what, what do I like to do? I love to do it, live it, share it. And then you meet all these people and we're having conversations like this Yeah. and it's completely flow based. And it's right. like, well, uh, if I were to go somewhere else, what else would I be doing? I mean, right. I could do whatever. I mean, I didn't have to do this YouTube channel. Right. It was something that it was like, it was an inspiration for me, but I actually wanted to get involved with some other kind of business that was outside of it. And sometimes I even think about it as well. I think, you know, I want to do something. Um, I want to start another venture. Right. And I don't know what it will be in yet. And so this, uh, but I love doing this. I keep like coming back to it. Not probably you know, end up starting it. But the, the, the main thing is you're doing what you love to do because that was always for, for my journey. And it seems like you're very much in harmony with that mm-hmm. is you, you keep identifying what you love to do and what you love to do. And I learned some Steve Jobs, the commencement speech, right? He said, follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already so know what, do what you love to do. So this like constant, like doing what you love to do, doing what you love to do is like a facilitator of the 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 vision or the 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 desired outcome it's like becomes the facilitator of so perhaps then a we are already ascended b (laughs) uh and and all of us are or b right we when we do go there we'll just like i said you'll be this guy who's uh who's who's continuously learning from the others right right? and when you go there they'll be like the neville too right neville had gone somewhere else he was there in that world (laughs) right and then he's gone somewhere else and like the new there'd be those new thought authors and perhaps it was always like that yeah you know you just get i get people that say isn't it enough brian don't you have enough information (laughs) don't haven't you read enough don't you already know everything you get those people that make comments on youtube videos right and it's like you know i get where you're coming from it's this my state i could be it doesn't matter what level of poverty or, or or wealth i'm at or what i'm doing I will constantly be wanting to gather information. It's simply my state. It's who I am. It's a fundamental part of who I am. That, and so uh, I, I recognize that state in you. There's a state of a desire to learn, a desire to expand our knowledge. Even when you pretty much have the, the essentials, you could stop right now and you have everything you need to know. But there's a part of me that is continuing. I don't care if I already know everything I need to know. I want to you continue. Know what? The one thing for me is communication. Right. That is like it never ends the internal communication and the external communication. Yeah. 
for me, that is as going back to the earlier part of my discussion, mm -hmm. our discussions, it was, it was always there. Right. Maybe one day it'll end. And so that's another reason why I really love and resonate with Neville's, uh, he says, the coin of heaven, the gifts of speech and mind. It just right. speaks so deeply to me. And that's probably the reason why I was so attracted to Think and Grow Rich, because the book literally said, think and grow rich. Think. So thinking is a bunch of words to me. It's, uh, it's like sequencing words together. You know, right. someone like Jay Abraham, he's, he's sequencing words together and someone gets it, facilitates a, a, a breakthrough. And he's got a lot of experience because he did all these things back in the days from copyright, direct response market, right. contemplative selling, which are, which are word-based uh, skills, right? Direct right. response marketing is, is, is sequencing words together. So this kind of stuff continues to fascinate me. So I don't know how it could end. Right? No, how maybe could it, it ends like at a certain point, like God spoke the world into existence. Let there be right when you create a world, you get to that level of precision. We could spend a whole episode just on words. Yeah, as somebody that one of my one of my degrees is in communication. Mm -hmm. Uh it's it's really <laughs> fundamentally uh I am fascinated by the use of words. I love watching politicians and lawyers and people and even advertisements use these concepts that we started with neuro-linguistic programming that has been evolving there is this 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 formulation of communication that when you become aware of it it's 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 fascinating game yeah. that you see interplaying all the time uh people are not aware of the power of just words that what we think what we use what we say some words are so massively powerful um and it, it, it is interesting we're constantly being defined by the words we use and the wor words that we hear and yeah that's we could spend a whole other um, cause it fascinates me to no end. And you talk yourself into the state, right? Right. And then you listen to Alan Watts talk about the fundamental of meditation is releasing that. Like you, you constantly hear a noise yeah. and then you put a word on that noise. And so it's hard for me when I sit and I sit outside and I hear the truck go by, I say truck and I hear the bird and I say bird, like, how can I go beyond the word? Cause words, I, I'm automatically identifying a word with everything. And I am. I guess we limit it a little bit when we use a word we are yeah. limiting that thing because it is always more than that word when yeah, i say toyota yeah. you know it's always going to be more right so it's like yeah when you put you put the word out there and then you reflect upon the word and you can say i could have said it this way and it keeps going right. and going and going, and going. Well, that's why i really like to infuse this stuff with uh eckhart Tolle stuff you know when right. you're talking about, look just uh just chill and don't have any word it it does something for me it, it brings me into the pole, what, what we consider the polar opposite of that. Right. And uh, that has power as well, because I found that when I do go into that eternal now, that meditative now, where I'm not putting words on things, right? then I get even more accurate, precise words. So it's like yin and yang type of thing. It's all one, right? Right. It's all one. So it's like, sometimes I go here into no words, no, like, what was it in the Kabbalion, Hermes Trismegistus, like, responded to his students by not saying anything right There's meaning in that right so perhaps the next level of consciousness if there if you believe in that concept this idea that we are moving in stages of evolutionary consciousness and the next level is, is it's beyond words it's a mental communication it's a psychic if, if there's no there's some things that are inexplainable with words there, there yeah. may be a point where i can mentally communicate with you and send images and feelings and smells all in one experience and that's the only way i could truly explain it like it, it, there's no way i can put words into this right there's going to be a point where we have a higher understanding and i think we're maybe in a process of slowly unveiling there's a little tiny part of us in this human experience where we start to get a taste of that uh, where we get a taste of the empathy of hearing emotions and, and feeling mm -hmm. emotions and, and, and vision and beyond. And it's really fun to think of and talk about for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. but this has been a joy and I just want to um, thank you for coming on the reality revolution and um, let's plan on doing this again and taking it to another level. And uh, so don't any words. we, we'll we could just sit here like this. And everyone will know. And like if just, you watch Mandalorian, if you got a chance to watch the most recent episode of Mandalorian, she communicates with ba baby Yoda. Just they just like look at each other over the fire. She has I this long. <laughs> you know, my grandmother and I have that connection. We could sit in a room 
when I went to go see her in India, you know, because she's really old right now, she raised right. her. And uh, when I sat with her, she said so many things without uttering a word. So many uh, answers to questions that I had were revealed to me. Amazing. So I'm not surprised. It's there's definitely something there. So, but everybody check out Joseph's channel and welcome to the reality revolution. Thanks, Brian. And thank you, everybody. And I look forward to chatting soon. All right. Thank you. Well, welcome to the reality revolution. I'm just really excited today because this is the first day that my book is released. This is it, The Reality Revolution. Worked on this for a very long time. So many of the things that I discovered along the way, and I was excited to share it with everybody. Tell you a little bit about it. Uh, I'm like everybody else. I'm interacting in the world and, and starting to realize that my thoughts created reality. As I did this, I started to see some major shifts in my reality. I started to explore the idea of maneuvering through parallel realities. I'm your host, Brian Scott.